je commence en français un peu. Parce que euh, j'ai utilisé le modèle de, de, de présentation et était une photo d'un homme plus intéressant, plus, euh, plus beau que moi. Alors, le laissez là-bas, ce photo. Euh, euh, je, vraiment, c'est ça. Je suis désolé. Uh, I will change to English, though, because I can't speak very technically in, in French. Um, but uh, let me ask you guys, let me start with you. How many of you have used containers today? Like, have ran containers? All right, I would hope the majority. How many of you have committed major pieces of code to a container engine? A couple. Ooh, I like that. All right, good. Those people will already understand these things. How many of you, though, are using something technical and it annoys you if you don't... There's a certain level you need to understand it before you get, like, the, the feeling where you feel good and you want to use it, especially when it breaks and you need to troubleshoot it. <laughs> All right, so a decent amount... Those are the people that have been in technology a while. The rest of you might not have understood. Um, like, <laughs> I don't know. Me, personally... I was a systems administrator for many years, so I, I feel the pain of um, not knowing how something works at a level to where I can troubleshoot it quickly, basically. So I need to always know enough. Um, in my role, I have to know things well enough to, to go out, talk to customers, understand what weird edge case thing they're trying to do, um, and then basically come back to the engineering team and, and, and basically say, hey, is this doable? Could we do this? And if I don't have any clue of how some of the deep internals work, I'm not comfortable, like, just figuring out how long it will take us to do something. So basically, for me, I have to know. I, I need to know. Um, so I will start. I'm going to talk about standards. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do a couple demos, and I'm going to show like kind of how a container engine actually works. But to do that, I need to define you know, what is a container in Linux. And I say that specifically in Linux because it's different in Linux than in Solaris and in other Unixes. You know, in other Unixes, there are there are actually you know, primitives for containers. But in Linux, so I'm going to do a demo where I show a Docker run. So I'm going to show you like just a container firing up in Docker. I'm going to show one in Podman. We're going to fire a second one up. And then we're going to, how many of you are familiar with rootless containers? All right, so a few. So in this terminal, if you look, I am actually a regular user. I am Father Linux. That's my normal user. Um, and then what I do here is I'm going to run a container with Podman as non-root. So I'm going to fire it up. And you'll see, if you've used Docker, this should be fairly familiar, right? You see I get back the, the, the label that basically says what it is. But now let me show you something. So what we're doing here is in Red Hat world, Every container fires up in SE Linux, and they all fire up as type container T. And I won't go deep into the, the internals of, of, of SE Linux, but what I'm doing here is a simple thing. All I'm doing is getting rid of the grep and then looking for the processes that are running with container T. And you'll see there's three containers running, right? There's three processes running that all have bash in them that are all running as container T. Which one was started by which thing? Can you tell? If you look closely, you can tell one of them. You'll notice the last one is started as Father Linux. So that's mine. That's the rootless one. The other two are root, but can you tell those apart? Anybody raise your hand if you can tell it apart. <laughs> it's impossible, right? Once, once the container's fired up, it's not possible to tell what, you know, what started it, essentially. And that's because in Linux, there's no definition in the kernel for what a container is. All it is is it's a user space definition. And so I show here just a, a, a very simple drawing of, you know, this is how a bash process fires up, right? Like when you, talk, when you type a command in bash, you execute a fork or exec, it talks to the kernel, the kernel fires up the process. In, with containers, with, whether it's Podman or Docker or Cryo, or, or almost any other container engine on the planet, most of them use run C. Um, and run C is what defines what that container looks like. It's what defines the set of technology that gets fired up when you go to basically fire up a container. And I'm going to dig a little deeper and show you what all that looks like in the second demo. But I just want you to, at a high level, 
you see the user space is what defines it. It's not, it's not defined in the kernel, it's defined in the user space. So the, the philosophy in Linux is different than in a lot of other Unixes in that uh, historically with containers, the idea was to let the user space experiment and like mix and match the technologies in the kernel to figure out what things worked and what didn't. And we've kind of come to a point where we're actually at a point where C groups, SE Linux, App Armor, you know, Sec Comp, as Liz mentioned, um, and, and, and especially a clone system call. We've kind of finally got what looks like a container, and there is actually work in the Linux community to define what that may look like going forward. In fact, in recent months, like the last month, there's been talk about defining something in the Linux kernel. So then you would be able to tell them apart at, down the road because we may have a different command that would show us that. But, so now everyone understands basically that a Linux process, a, 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 a container is a Linux process. But now let's understand what a container engine does. So I showed that drawing with Podman. Podman is an alternative to Docker, if you didn't figure that out already, by reverse engineering, watching me type commands. And the commands looked quite similar to Docker. Um, but all container engines do this, whether it's Cryo, uh, my shirt, um, Podman, you know, really any container engine, basically does three main things. And I, I jokingly, I'll go a little deeper than this, but the main job it has is to collect user input, right? That's, that's the first thing. So if you think about all the command line options that you pass it, that's the person running the container communicating how you want the container to be ran. That doesn't mean that you have complete control, but you have an ability to, to specify some of the way of how you want it ran. Um, and then the second thing that the container engine does is manage storage. And what a lot of people don't understand about this is when you pull the image, the container engine is typically talking to the kernel right then at that moment that you pull the image to map those container image layers to storage in the host. And so there's kernel interaction even at the pull, not just at the run. But then when you run it, typically another copy on write layer is added, which I, I have a drawing that will go deeper into this. And then finally, the last job for the container engine is to just pass it off to, to what's called a container runtime, run C. And run C is what defines, and in fact, run C is governed by the OCI runtime standard. So it's the reference implementation of the OCI runtime standard. And so any container engine that basically starts a container with run C starts them the same way. And so then once they're running, you can't really tell them apart. There's little pieces, parts. I actually did a demo where I, I fire up one with run C alone, with Podman, with Docker, with Cryo. And the run C one doesn't have SE Linux, SVIRT, so you don't see some of the labels. So you can, you can reverse engineer a little bit by which technologies got turned on, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And then optionally, this is, when the, this is the one that hurt my brain later in that I realized I wasn't talking through the networking. It actually, this works quite similar to run C, and I'll dig a little bit deeper, but think of CNI as uh, another standard that governs the way networking works, and people are probably familiar with in the Kubernetes world, but, and, and Cryo uses it, but Podman also uses it, uh, and so did Rocket, another container engine. They, in fact, I think, pushed for the standard. Um, and, and so, I should say, CoreOS, before we acquired them, created something called Rocket, and Rocket, I think, pushed for the standard, for the CNI standard. Um, but CNI works very similar to Run C, where basically you handed a config blob, and we'll get deeper into this, you just handed a JSON config file, and then a binary, and it runs, just like Run C. All right, so now let's go a layer deeper into what a container engine does. So at build time, um, you know, there's, there, it, you can basically collect user input, and that's the time when the user, um, you know, essentially specifies the, the way they want the image to be ran. They specify the architecture of the image, maybe whether it's Linux or Windows, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things that the builder can do to embed logic in the container image, and, and all this gets saved as JSON. At runtime, it's a combination of things. It's, it's some of that image config input, which is, which is up here, you'll see. Um, it's the image config input plus what the user wants. So like the user may, for example, if I build an image and I specify the default command, the user can come in and override that default command. They can run a different command than was embedded in the image. Then thirdly, the container engine can actually override things. So for example, if you don't specify, Liz mentioned set comp rules, by default, Docker will use a default set comp, but, but Cryo doesn't, and Kubernetes doesn't. And so 
the, con the container engine can actually have control over which things are default and which things are not. You'll see like SVIRT, for example, or, or SecComp and things like that. A lot of the security controls, you'll see the defaults are different between different engines, even in different Linux distributions. And so when you smash all three of these things together, what gets created is something called a config.json. And this is a, a JSON file that conforms to the, to the runtime specification, basically. It's what tells, it's what tells Run C how to fire up a container. And then on this side, I show a simple version of, you know, the image layers get pulled down, they get mapped with what's called a graph driver into what's called a root file system directory. And if you think about it, and I, I demo it sometimes where Podman, I, there's a command called Podman mount. If you do a Podman mount, it gives you back a directory, and you can just CD into the directory and start mucking around with the container storage. And it looks just like a directory. And then you can actually fire it up later after you've mucked around with it, and you'll see, oh, I see the, the container engine just takes all these image layers, smashes them together, and creates a directory, basically. That's all it's doing. Then, I, I, again, the optional version, which is more complex, CNI. CNI really does pretty much the same thing, right? Um, there is some stuff that can happen in the image, like you could specify an IP address. You can do, you can do weird stuff um, in the image. And then, and then, you know, again, the user can override what they want by specifying things to the container engine. The container engine will take those, then hand them off to CNI. Um, and then finally, you know, that config blob, what they call a config blob, colloquially in English, we say a config blob. I don't know where that came from, but just a con it's basically a JSON config file, just like, just like Run C. And then you hand that to any one of the CNI binaries are basically just binaries that are very similar to Run C, and they expect to be handed that config file, and there's a standard. CNI is what governs that standard of how that talks, you know, basically how that binary knows what to read out of that config file. So the second thing that a container engine does is it manages storage. And on the left, I show the storage uh, at pull time, so at rest and at runtime, right? So there's two different places that things interact with the kernel. And this drawing shows basically the, the different kernel technologies that get turned on because this is, these are drawings that I stole from a, from a very deep lab that I do where I talk about which kernel technologies get turned on. But in a nutshell, the one on the left shows each of the layers in that image get mapped to layers in the file system. And this happens at pull time. So when you pull the image, that's what happens. Um, at runtime, on the, on the right side, though, you'll see that it'll add an extra layer. That's what those cow layers, copy on write layers are. So when you do the podman run or the docker run or when you fire up the container, it adds one more layer, smashes that together with the other layers, and it looks like a directory. It's read-writable. Anything you write, though, goes into that top layer. But then you can read from any of the layers below. And then if you mount, for example, in this example, I show varlib MySQL, you know, you will typically go through a VFS driver, which is a shared driver in a Linux kernel, um, and then that will, you know, go to whatever, whether it's XFS or extension 4 or whatever, or, or, you know, whatever native NFS, whatever file system you're going through to, to map to. And, and there's one little caveat that I love to talk about here. You should almost always specify a bind mount for anything you're doing. Like, even if it's ephemeral, you should still do it, because it's much faster than copy on write. And I've seen people do things like, try to compile Yocto Linux in a container and try to write out thousands of files and thousands of permissions, and it's super slow because they're doing it on a copy on write layer. So this really throws people for a loop. They don't realize, oh, there's a copy on write layer in there, and I'm, it's really slow. So the final thing I mentioned that a container engine does is it hands, you know, it basically creates this config.json that I mentioned that is the, the you know, the summation of the user input, the image user, the image creator's input, the run, the person that's running the image's input, and then what the container engine wants to add to it. And then what we have at the end of the day is a file system, literally a directory. It's just a directory and then a config file. And then we hand, we actually embed the location of the directory in the config file and we just hand the config file to run C. So at the end of the day, what happens is the container engine calls run C with just this config file. And now we have something that looks a lot like what we would humans, us humans would refer to as a container. Now we're getting to the point where this is really like a container. And these are governed by three main standards, right? So I, I talk about, a lot of people are familiar with the image specification and the runtime specification. The image specification is what governs all of that metadata and the layers, the way we save those layers and the metadata in the image. So again, when the image builder creates something, they embed stuff in there, that is all governed by the image specification. Then on the runtime side, when you go to run that, and the way 
the container engine has to take that information from the image uh, spec and then basically take some of it, add it, do things, add user input, et cetera, et cetera, like I said, then create the, the runtime config. That's governed by the runtime specification. And then run C, that program I showed you, is, is the reference implementation of the runtime spec. But there's also the distribution spec. This was one that we missed early on when we were doing standards and around containers. And uh, this distribution spec is what allows us to basically share container images. So if I were to break this down into a simple you know, basic use case, it's basically you know, build is the image spec, share is the distribution spec, and run. And so if you look at it, that's basically the workflow, right? Somebody has to go build something that's compatible. Then they have to build a share it. And, and, then they have, and then someone else has to be able to come along and pull it down and run it. And so these three standards are pretty rock solid because they basically allow us to do the main use case that we want to do with containers. And then, of course, because I can never stop going a little bit deeper, I have to show you like, how it works with a container engine. So this is, this is kind of a, a high-level architecture of the way Podman and Cryo work. Um, and, and this one in particular, I show Podman. But you'll see there's, you know, there's standards that govern basically whether you, you know, how you grab the image, how you pull it down. And we have that embedded in a library called container slash image. And that, that's mandated, you know, that basically speaks to the registry server and knows how to consume those images. And then we have something called container storage. And storage is what knows how to then map that into the file system and talk to the kernel using overlay file system to then map that storage locally to like varlib containers. And you'll see that's not governed by a standard, right? The container engine's left to do whatever it wants there. Now having some kind of open source library there is really convenient, but it's not governed by any standard. There's no standard that says you have to take the container image and map it this way into the file system. The container engine is left to do whatever it wants. Because as long as it provides a directory to the, run, the runtime specification, it, you know, the runtime specification doesn't care how the container engine got there as long as it gets there. Um, and then finally, you'll see the runtime spec I show at the bottom. In this case, you know, I show it running on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux host. But, but this, is, this is basically, again, we, we kind of map out where the file, you know, there, we have standard locations of where we put our files, basically, is what I'm trying to show here in a, in a RHEL or in a Red Hat world. So again, not governed by the spec, but as long as it's somewhere and it's understood, it's not bad. And this is what allows us to basically have, you know, different container engines that can all run the exact same containers. So now I want to go to the second demo. Um, let's go to this Guy. Let's do a podman kill dash a and then rm dash a. So let's do this. Let's do a create. So, what we're going to do here, can you see this all? All right, let me actually bump that up a hair. Actually, I guess it's, it'll wrap. Um, what we're doing here is we're going to create just a, a simple container again. We're going to name it Frankenstein and we're going to create it from scratch. And then, what I want to show you that happens here is what happened here is if this image wouldn't have been pulled, it would have, it would have pulled it and mapped it into the file system. So at this point, we have a container image mapped into the file system. We don't have a copy on write layer. There's no copy on write layer yet. So like, there's no way to write into this container, and there's no process running. It's just, a, it's just the storage has been mapped. Now, if we do a podman mount Frankenstein, we get back a directory. This is our copy on write layer. So this is, I could go touch a file in here. So for example, and I'm kind of winging this demo a little bit, so let's do this. Uh, so let's do an ls so you understand. Looks just like a root file system, right? Looks just like if you SSH'd into the container. But there's no container running. All we do is have the storage mapped locally. Um, in fact, I could touch, you know, let's touch a file because I like to do this uh, to show you. And then let's, let's just put temp in there. Or let's put Scott in there to prove it. Oop. Oh, it's because I grabbed that. All right, so now let's do, a, let's do an ls again on that. You'll see the Scott file is in there, right? But again, no containers running yet. Now let's do something called podman init. Uh, and then we'll do Frankenstein. Now we get back, uh, now what's happened is we've actually went and created the config.json. So you can actually go see the config. Uh, and and this, this is my, here, I'll, I'll clear this so you guys can see this. Um, this is a cool little command. I, I, what I'm doing here is in varlib containers, that's where the storage is, right? 
and we know it's using an overlay file system. And so all those image layers have been mapped into that, into that directory, right? Um, and then we've created another container. That, that, that's basically what I'm getting back. I'm getting back the container ID by doing a podman ps. Dash L is a, is a cool little thing in podman where you can just get the last container that was ran. And then Q makes it so that it, it doesn't output the other things. And then no trunk. This basically just gets us back that key, you know, that, that, that label, that, uh, uh, that SHA. And so then we go into user data and then config JSON. And then here I just want to show you this is the config file that got created. So this complies to the OCI standard, right? And if you look, you'll notice some things in here that are embedded, like, you know, bash is embedded in there. Um, there's things like OCI container, container equal OCI. That came from the image spec, right? Uh, some of these things clearly come from the image spec. Some of them, though, like bash, come from the user, right? I specified bash on the command line. And then as we go further down, you'll see a lot of this stuff gets added by the container engine. So if you look down, this is a, you know, capabilities in Linux, which I didn't mention. There's, uh, there's SE Linux rules. There's, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that get added in here. Uh, there's, there's uh, you know, all kinds of rules around security, especially around set comp, things like that. So you'll see that all gets added by the container engine. Building that yourself would be really nasty, right? Like, I don't want to do this myself. This is a ton of work. Although you can do it with just run C, you start to understand it's really nice to rely on a container engine to go create all that metadata. But it's still really nice to understand it, too, so that I can go in there and muck around and see what the container engine did, see which security things it used, you know, and understand it. So, so if we do this now, though, you'll see podman ps-a. We, we still don't have it running. There's still no process running, right? Like, there's nothing running in this container. But there is, there is, it's still in the created state, and we have a config file. So we went and created the storage, we went and created the config file, and now we can basically run it. So let's do a podman uh, start Frankenstein, and then do a podman ps. So now it's running. Now we can do a podman exec uh, dash it. And then we can, you can, you can see. If you, well, you see right there, I, I have the file now. There's a Scott file in the container. Now we're in a real container that's running, and it has, and it has two processes running. Oh, no PS command. Oh, well. Um, so <laughs> I told you I was going to wing it a little bit. Um, so you can see there, though, the beauty of this is I was able to go in, muck around with the storage. I now understand the way a container actually gets built really, really well now. And it, it's not that hard. It's not rocket science. And it's all governed by standards, right? So it's, it's really elegant that, that all this works together. So let's go back. So there is a lot of innovation happening at this layer. I showed you, I showed you the, the drawings. You know, I kind of showed you of like what's going on below the, below the hood in Podman and, and Builda and Scopio and Cryo and all of these different things that, are, you know, that basically utilize these standards. Um, Containers is what, so if you go to github.com slash containers, containers is the project that basically captures images storage, uh, or, or container st image and container storage. Um, and basically, this is the same, these are the same underlying libraries that are used by all these tools. So basically, when we modify the libraries, all these tools and other tools, there are other people using some of those underlying libraries. And the beauty of having this all broken up again and the fact that all these standards work is we can then go play around with things like, these are the things that are on my roadmap, for example, like figuring out how are we going to do Creo with Podman. Um, Live migration isn't super interesting, but maybe checkpointing a Java server is, right? Like having it start up in two seconds or one second with a full JVM running. That's kind of interesting. Um, being able to play around with that. Obviously, there's a lot of work that we do in the Linux kernel. Um, you know, there's a lot of work we do with SE Linux. There's work we do with Open SCAP. Um, figuring out how to mix and match these technologies to new, cool new things, that's what this allows us to do now and break it down into smaller problems where we can make little experiments and then incrementally improve security, performance, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really cool that we have these standards because now we can go and play, basically, and, and invent. And so if you're, if you're interested in uh, you know, then going a little bit deeper in Podman build Scopio, Dan Walsh is here, and he's actually speaking a half an hour. I don't know if we're having our full break or not, because it looks like we're a little bit behind. But he, so I think he's supposed to be speaking right now. But, um, but basically, uh, we're, we're gonna, he's going to be talking in Sal 2, or in, in, in Sal 2. So uh, if you want to see it and you want to go deeper into this, I invite you guys to come check it out. So with that, I, I will part. So thank you. <laughs>
C'était un plaisir.